This is Audible. Audio Literature presents Journey of Souls by Michael Newton, read by Chris Bogart, Amy Hill, and Stephen O'Hara. Are you afraid of death? Do you wonder what is going to happen to you after you die? Is it possible you have a spirit which came from somewhere else and will return there after your body dies? Or is this just wishful thinking because you're afraid? It is a paradox that humans, alone of all creatures of the earth, must repress the fear of death in order to lead normal lives. Yet our biological instinct never lets us forget this ultimate danger to our being. As we grow older, the specter of death rises in our consciousness. Dying makes all our earthly goals seem futile. The true answers to the mystery of life after death remain locked behind a spiritual door for most people. This is because we have built-in amnesia about our soul identity, which, on a conscious level, aids in the merging of the soul and human brain. In the last years, the general public has heard about people who temporarily died and then came back to life to tell about seeing a long tunnel, bright lights, and even brief encounters with friendly spirits. I am a skeptic by nature. As a counselor and hypnotherapist, I specialize in behavior modification for the treatment of psychological disorders. A large part of my work involves short-term cognitive restructuring with clients by helping them connect thoughts and emotions to promote healthy behavior. Together, we elicit the meaning, function, and consequences of their beliefs because I take the premise that no mental problem is imaginary. In the early days of my practice, I resisted past life requests from people because of my orientation toward traditional therapy. While I used hypnosis and age regression techniques to determine the origins of disturbing memories and childhood trauma, I felt any attempt to reach a former life was unorthodox and non-clinical. The case that opened the door to the spirit world for me was a middle-aged woman who was an especially receptive hypnosis subject. She had been talking to me about her feelings of loneliness and isolation in that delicate stage when a subject has finished recalling their most recent past life. This unusual individual slipped into the highest state of altered consciousness almost by herself. Without realizing I had initiated an overly short command for this action, I suggested she go to the source of her loss of companionship. At the same moment, I inadvertently used one of the trigger words to spiritual recall. I also asked if she had a specific group of friends whom she missed. Suddenly, my client started to cry. When I directed her to tell me what was wrong, she blurted out, I miss some friends in my group, and that's why I get so lonely on earth. I was confused and questioned her further about where this group of friends was actually located. Here in my permanent home, she answered simply, and I'm looking at all of them right now. How is it possible to reach the soul through hypnosis? Visualize the mind as having three concentric circles, each smaller than the last and within the other, separated only by layers of connected mind consciousness. The first outer layer is represented only by layers of connected mind consciousness. The first outer layer is represented by the conscious mind, which is our critical analytical reasoning source. The second layer is the subconscious, where we initially go into hypnosis to tap into the storage area for all the memories that ever happened to us in this life and former lives. The third, the innermost core, is what we are now calling the superconscious mind. This level exposes the highest center of self, where we are an expression of a higher power. The superconscious houses our real identity augmented by the subconscious, which contains the memories of many alter egos assumed by us in our former human bodies. The superconscious may not be a level at all, but the soul itself. The superconscious mind represents our highest center of wisdom and perspective, and all of my information about life after death comes from this source of intelligent energy. The travels of souls from time of death to their next incarnation has come to me from a ten-year collection of clients. It surprised me at first that I had people who remembered parts of their soul's life more clearly after distant lifetimes than recent ones. Yet for some reason, no one subject was able to recall the entire chronology of soul activities. My clients remember certain aspects of their spiritual life quite vividly, while other experiences are hazy to them. I find it very rewarding to watch the look of wonder on a client's face when his or her session ends. 
For those of us who have had the opportunity to actually see our immortality, a new depth of self-understanding and empowerment emerges. Before awakening my subjects, I often implant appropriate post-suggestion memories. Having a conscious knowledge of their soul life in the spirit world and a history of physical existences on planets gives these people a stronger sense of direction and energy for life. We have a great deal of documentation, including observations from medical personnel, which describes the out-of-body, near-death experiences of people severely injured in accidents. These people were considered clinically dead before medical efforts brought them back from the other side. Souls are quite capable of leaving and returning to their host bodies, particularly in life-threatening situations where the body is dying. People tell of hovering over their bodies, especially in hospitals, watching doctors perform life-saving procedures on them. In time, these memories fade after they return to life. What are the similarities of afterlife recollection between people reporting on their out-of-body experiences as a result of a temporary physical trauma and a subject in hypnosis recalling death in a past life? Both find themselves floating around their bodies in a strange way, trying to touch solid objects which dematerialize in front of them. Both state they feel a pulling sensation away from the place where they died and experience relaxation and curiosity rather than fear. The following case will take us into the death experience. The subject here is a man in his 60s describing to me the events of his death as a young woman called Sally, who was killed by Kiowa Indians in an attack on a wagon train in 1866. Are you in great pain from the arrow? Yes. The point has torn my throat. I'm dying. I'm choking, blood pouring down. Will, my husband, is holding me. The pain... Terrible. I'm, I'm getting out now. It's over anyway. All right, Sally. You have accepted being killed by these Indians. Will you please describe to me the exact sensation you feel at the time of death? Like a force of some kind pushing me up out of my body. I'm ejected out of the top of my head. And what was pushed out? Well, me. What does the thing that is you look like going out of the head of your body? Like a pinpoint of light radiating. How do you radiate light? From my energy, I look sort of transparent white. And does this energy light stay the same after leaving your body? I seem to grow a little as I move around. If your light expands, then what do you look like now? A wispy string hanging. Is the feeling unpleasant? Oh, no, it's wonderful to feel so free with no more pain, but I'm disoriented. I didn't expect to die. I understand, Sally. You are feeling a little displacement at the moment as a soul... Are you able to move around freely right after death? It's strange. It's as if I'm suspended in air that isn't air. I'm weightless. You mean it's sort of like being in a, in a vacuum for you? Yes. Nothing around me is a solid mass. Can you control your movements where you are going? Yes, I can do some of that, but there is a pulling into a bright whiteness. It's so bright. How would you describe this thing that is pulling you? A kind of magnetic force, but... I want to stay a little longer. Can your soul resist this pulling sensation for as long as you want? Yes, I can, if I really want to stay. Oh, it's awful what those savages did to my body. There is blood all over my pretty blue dress. My husband, Will, is trying to hold me and still fight with our friends against the Kiowa. All right, Sally. Uh, now we're going to move forward in relative time again. Do you see your wagon train friends placing your body in some kind of grave? Yes, they have buried me. It's time for me to go. They are coming for me now. I'm moving into a brighter light. How should we best prepare for our own death? Our lives may be short or long, healthy or sick, but there comes that time when we all must meet death in a way suited for us. If we have had a long illness leading to death, there is time to adequately prepare the mind once initial shock, denial, and depression have passed. The mind takes a shortcut through this sort of progression when we face death suddenly. As the end of our physical life draws near, each of us has the capacity to fuse with our higher consciousness. Dying is the easiest period in our lives for spiritual awareness when we can sense our soul is connected to the eternity of time. For thousands of years, the people of Mesopotamia believed the gates into and out of heaven lay at opposite ends of the great curve of the Milky Way 
called the River of Souls. After death, souls had to wait for the rising doorway of Sagittarius and the autumn equinox when day and night are equal. Reincarnation back to Earth could only take place during the spring equinox through the Gemini exit in their night sky. My subjects tell me the soul migration is actually much easier. The tunnel effect they experience when leaving Earth is the portal into the spirit world. Although souls leave their bodies swiftly, it seems to me entry into the spirit world is a carefully measured process. Later, when we return to Earth in another life, the route back is described as being more rapid. You are now leaving your body. See yourself move further and further away from the place where you died, away from the plane of Earth. At first it was very bright close to Earth. Now it's a little darker because I have gone into a tunnel. It's a hollow, dim vent, and there is a small circle of light at the other end. I feel a tugging, a gentle pulling. I think I'm supposed to drift through this tunnel, and I do. It is more gray than dark now because the bright circle is expanding in front of me. It's as if I'm being summoned forward. Let the circle of light expand in front of you at the end of the tunnel and continue to explain what is happening to you. The circle of light grows very wide and I'm out of the tunnel. There is a cloudy brightness, a light fog. I'm filtering through it. As you leave the tunnel, what else stands out in your mind besides the lack of absolute visual clarity? It's so still that it's such a quiet place to be in and, and I'm in the place of spirits. Do you have any other impressions at this moment as a soul? Thought. I feel the power of thought all around me. I feel thoughts of love, companionship, empathy, and it's all combined with anticipation as if others are waiting for me. You mentioned cloud-like substances around you right after leaving the tunnel. Are you in a sky over Earth? No, not that, but I seem to be floating through cloud stuff which is different from Earth. Can you see the Earth at all? Is it below you? Maybe it is, but I haven't seen it since I went into the tunnel. Do you sense you are still connected to Earth through another dimension, perhaps? Well, that's a possibility. Yes, in my mind, Earth seems close, and I still feel connected to Earth, but I know I'm in another space. Once through the tunnel, our souls have passed the initial gateway of their journey into the spirit world. Most now fully realize they are not really dead, but have simply left the encumbrance of an earth body which has died. With this awareness comes acceptance in varying degrees depending upon the soul. The most common type of reaction I hear is a relieved sigh, followed by something on the order of, Oh, wonderful! I'm home in this beautiful place again. I enjoy hearing from subjects about their first images of the spirit world. People may see fields of wildflowers, castle towers rising in the distance, or rainbows under an open sky when returning to this place of adoration after an absence. These first ethereal earth scenes of the spirit world don't seem to change a great deal over a span of lives for the returning soul, although there is variety between client descriptions. I find that once a subject in trance continues further into the spirit world to describe the functional aspects of spiritual life, the comments become more uniform. If a soul has been traumatized by unfinished business, usually the first entity it sees right after death is its guide. These highly developed spiritual teachers are prepared to take the initial brunt of a soul's frustration following an untimely death. New arrivals in the spirit world have little time to float around wondering where they are or what is going to happen to them next. Our guides and a number of soulmates and friends wait for us to provide recognition, affection, and the assurance we are all right. Actually, we feel their presence from the moment of death because much of our initial readjustment depends upon the influence of these kindly entities toward our returning soul. It is important we understand welcoming entities may not be part of our own particular learning group in the spirit world. This is because all the people who are close to us in our lives are not on the same developmental level. Simply because they choose to meet us right after death out of love and kindness does not mean they will all be part of our spiritual learning group when we arrive at the final destination of this journey. You just started to actually leave the Earth's astral plane now and are moving further and further into the spirit world. Is anyone coming to meet you? Yes, it's my friend Rachel. She is always here for me when I die. Is Rachel a soulmate who has been with you in other lives, or is she someone who always remains here? 
She doesn't always stay here, no. She is with me a lot, in my mind, when I need her. She is my own guardian. Are you locked into male or female attributes during your spiritual existence? No. As souls, there are periods in our existence when we are more inclined toward one gender than another. Eventually, this natural preference evens out. Do you and Rachel actually look at each other with eyes in a human way? Sort of, but different. You see, the mind behind what we take to be eyes, because that is what we relate to on Earth. When you look into a certain person's eyes on the ground, even people you have just met, and see a light you have known before well, that tells you something about them. Your soul remembers. If your guardian did not project an image of herself in human form to you, would you have known her anyway? Well, naturally, we can always identify each other by the mind, but it's nicer this way. I know it sounds crazy, but it's a social thing. Seeing a familiar face puts you at ease. Can you tell me why you and the other souls project certain features at different times? It depends on where you are in your movements around here when you see another and your state of mind then. Do you favor projecting a certain set of facial features? Hmm. I like the face with the mustache having a rock-hard jaw. You mean when you were Jeff Tanner, the cowpuncher from Texas? That's it. And I have had faces like Jeff's in other lives, too. But why Jeff? Was it just because he was you in your last life? No. I felt good as Jeff. It was a happy, uncomplicated life. Damn, I looked great. Do you see souls who have gone to planets other than Earth? Once in a while. What features do souls from other planets besides Earth show you? I kind of stick with my own people, but we can assume any features we want for communication. Is this ability to transmit features to each other as souls a gift the Creator provided for us based upon spiritual need? How should I know? I'm not God. My own conceptions of what it must be like to be alone at the spiritual gateway and beyond is not shared by those souls who utilize the option of going solo. Actually, People in this category are experienced travelers. As older, mature souls, they seem to require no initial support system. They know right where they are going after death. I suspect the process is accelerated for them as well because they manage to more rapidly wind up where they belong than those who stop to meet others. There are souls who have been so severely damaged they are detached from the mainstream of souls going back to a spiritual home base. Compared to all returning entities, the number of these abnormal souls is not large. However, what has happened to them on Earth is significant because of the serious effect they have on other incarnated souls. There are two types of displaced souls, those who do not accept the fact their physical body is dead and fight returning to the spirit world for reasons of personal anguish, and those souls who have been subverted by or had complicity with criminal abnormalities in a human body. In the first instance, displacement is of the soul's own choosing, while in the second case, spiritual guides deliberately remove these souls from further association with other entities for an indeterminate period. In both situations, the guides of these souls are intimately concerned with rehabilitation. The troubled spirit is an immature entity with unfinished business in a past life on earth. They may have no relation to the living person who is disrupted by them. It is true that some people are convenient and receptive conduits for negative spirits who wish to express their querulous nature. This means that someone who is in a deep meditative state of consciousness might occasionally pick up annoying signal patterns from a discarnated being whose communications can range from the frivolous to provocative. These unsettled entities are not spiritual guides. Real guides are healers and don't intrude with acrimonious messages. I turn now to the far more prevalent second type of disturbed soul. These are souls who have been involved with evil acts. Should we first speculate if a soul can be considered culpable or guilt-free when it occupied the offending criminal brain? Is the soul mind or human ego responsible, or are they the same? Occasionally, a client will say to me, I feel possessed by an inner force which tells me to do bad things. 
There are mentally ill people who feel driven by opposing forces of good and evil over which they believe they have no control. Does hell exist to permanently separate good souls from bad ones? All my casework with the spirits of my subjects has convinced me there is no residence of terrible suffering for souls except on earth. I am told all souls go to one spirit world after death where everyone is treated with patience and love. I have also noticed that those beginner souls who are habitually associated with intensely negative human conduct in their first series of lives must endure individual spiritual isolation. Ultimately, they are placed together in their own group to intensify learning under close supervision. This is not punishment, but rather a kind of purgatory for the restructuring of self-awareness with these souls. Most errant souls are able to solve their own problems of contamination. The price we pay for our misdeeds and the rewards received for good conduct revolve around the laws of karma. Perpetrators of harm to others will do penance by setting themselves up as future victims in a karmic cycle of justice. The Bhagavad Gita has a passage which says, Souls of evil influence must redeem their virtue. The key to growth is understanding we are given the ability to make mid-course corrections in our life and having the courage to make necessary changes when what we are doing is not working for us. By conquering fear and taking risks, our karmic pattern adjusts to the effects of new choices. At the end of every life, rather than having a monster waiting to devour our souls, we serve as our most severe critic in front of teacher guides. This is why karma is both just and merciful. With the help of our spiritual counselors and peers, we decide on the proper mode of justice for our conduct. It is an open question whether a soul should be held entirely at fault for humanity's irrational, unsocialized, and destructive acts. Souls must learn to cope in different ways with each new human being assigned to them. The permanent identity of a soul stamps the human mind with a distinctive character, which is individual to that soul. However, I find there is a strange dual nature between the soul mind and human brain. After those entities who meet us during our homecoming have dispersed, we are ready to be taken to a space of healing. This will be followed by another stop involving the soul's reorientation to a spiritual environment. In this place, we are often examined by our guide. After you leave the friends who greeted you following your death, where does your soul go next in the spirit world? I am alone for a while, moving through vast distances. Then what happens to you? I am being guided by a force I can't see, into a more enclosed space, an opening into a place of pure energy. What is this area like? I see a bright, warm beam. It reaches out to me as a stream of liquid energy. There is a vapor-like steam swirling around me at first, then gently touching my soul as if it were alive. Then it is absorbed into me as fire, and I am bathed and cleansed from my hurts. You don't have a physical body anymore, so how can this energy shower heal a soul? By reaching into my being. I'm so tired from my last life with the body I had. Are you saying the ravages of the physical body and the human mind leaves an emotional mark on the soul after death? Oh God, yes. My very expression, who I am as a being, was affected by the brain and body I occupied. Even though you are now separated from that body forever? Each body leaves an imprint on you, at least for a while. There are some bodies I have had that I can never get away from altogether. Okay, now I want you to finish with your shower of healing and tell me what you feel. I am suspended in the light. It permeates through my soul, washing out most of the negative viruses. It allows me to let go of the bonds of my last life, bringing about my transformation so I can become whole again. What do you do now? When I am restored, I leave here and go to a quiet place to talk to my guide. The next case has a more in-depth therapeutic spiritual orientation. The exploration of attitudes and feelings with a view to reorienting future behavior is typical of guides. The client is a strong, imposing, 32-year-old woman dressed in jeans, boots, and a loose-fitting sweatshirt. Hester arrived at my office one day in a state of agitation. She was dissatisfied with her life as a successful real estate broker as being too materialistic and unfulfilling. This client then told me how she had easily manipulated men all her life because... 
there is a male aggression about me which also makes me feel incomplete as a woman. As a young girl, she avoided dolls and wearing dresses because she was more interested in competitive sports with boys. Her masculine feelings had not changed with age, although she had found a man who became her husband because he accepted her dominance in their relationship. In addition, my client complained of headaches on the right side of her head above the ear, which, after extensive medical examinations, doctors had attributed to stress. During our session, I learned this subject had experienced a recent series of male lives, culminating with a short life as a prosecuting attorney called Ross Felden in the state of Oklahoma during the 1880s. As Ross, my client had committed suicide at age 33 in a hotel room by shooting himself in the head. Ross was in despair over the direction his life had taken as a courtroom prosecutor. Now that you've left the shower of healing, where are you going? To see my advisor. His name is Clodise. I'm going to have to make some kind of accounting of myself. I go through this after all my lives, but this time I'm really in the soup because I killed myself. Well, when a person kills himself on Earth, does this mean they will receive some sort of punishment as a spirit? No, no, there is no such thing here as punishment. That's an Earth condition. Clodies will be disappointed that I bailed out early and didn't have the courage to face my difficulties. By choosing to die as I did means I have to come back later and deal with the same thing all over again in a different life. I just wasted a lot of time by checking out early. All right. Let's proceed into your conference with Clodies. First, describe your surroundings as you enter this space to see your advisor. I go into a room with walls. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's the Buckhorn, a great cattleman's bar in Oklahoma. I was happy as a patron there. I see Clodies is sitting at one of the tables waiting for me. Now we are going to talk. Well, go further into the Buckhorn Bar and tell me what you do. I float in and sit down across from Clodies at a round table near the front of the bar. Now that you're near Clodies, do you think he's as upset as you are over this past life? No, I'm more upset with myself over what I did and didn't do, and he knows that. Ross, we both need to understand what is happening psychologically to you right from the start of your orientation with Clodies. I want you to assist me. Are you willing to do this? Yes, I am. Now, be Clodies speaking his thoughts through you. You're sitting at a table across from the soul of Ross Felden. What do you say to him? You know you could have done better. Quickly now, be Ross Felden again. I tried, but I fell short of the goal. Now switch places again. Become the voice of Clodies' thoughts and answer Ross. If you could change anything about your life, what would it be? Respond as Ross. Not to be corrupted by power and money. And answer as Clodies. Why did you let these things detract from your original commitment? You're doing fine. Now answer your guide's question. I wanted to belong, to feel important in the community, to rise above others and be admired for my strength. Respond as Clodies. Especially by women. I observed you tried to dominate them sexually as well, making conquests without attachments. You must bring your self-awareness to bear on these matters. Answer is Ross. If I hadn't exerted power over these people, they would have controlled me. Respond as Clodies. This lacks merit and was unworthy of you. What you became is not how you started. We chose your parents carefully. Answer is Ross. Yes, I know. They brought me up to be idealistic, to help the little guy, and I wanted this too, but it didn't work for me. I like being around substantial people, and when I joined the establishment as a prosecutor, I had the idea of reforming the system and helping farm people. It was the system that was wrong. Respond as Clodies. Ah, you were corrupted by the system. Explain this to me. Answer is Ross. People had to pay fines they couldn't afford. Others I sent to jail because of offenses they didn't mean to commit. Others I had hung. I became a legal killer. Respond as Clodies. What about the victims of the people you prosecuted? Didn't you choose a life of law to help society and to make the farms and the towns safer with justice? Answer is Ross. Don't you see? It didn't work for me. I was turned into a murderer by a primitive society. Respond as Clodies. Too easily you became a participant with those whose motivations were for personal gain and notoriety. This is not you. Why did you hide from yourself? Answer is Ross. Why didn't you help me more when I started as a public defender? 
Respond as Clodis. What more would you have me do? You didn't reach far enough inside yourself. I placed thoughts in your mind of temperance, moderation, responsibility, original goals, your parents' love. You ignored these thoughts and were stubborn to alternative action. Answer is Ross. I know I missed the signs you set up. I wasted opportunities. I was afraid. Respond as Clodis to your statement. What do you value most about who you are? Answer your guide. That I had the desire to change things on Earth. I started with wanting to make a difference for the people of Earth. Respond as Clodis. You left that assignment early, and now I see you missing opportunities again, being afraid to take risks, taking paths which damage you, trying to become someone who is not you, and there is sadness again. With all the knowledge of who you were as Ross, why did you choose your current body? I chose to be a woman so people would not feel intimidated by me. Really? Then why did you take the body of such a strong, forceful woman in the 20th century? They won't see a prosecuting attorney dressed in black in a courtroom. As a woman, I knew I would be less intimidating to men. I can catch them off guard and scare them to death. What kind of men? The big guys, the power structure in society, catch them when they are lulled into a false sense of security because I'm a woman. Catch them and do what? Nail them. To save the little guy from the sharks who want to eat up all the small fish in this world. You wanted to help the same sort of people who you were unable to help as a man in your previous life, is that correct? Yeah, but it's not the best way. It's not working out for me like I thought. I'm doing it again, misusing people. I chose the body of a woman who is intimidating to men and I don't feel like a woman. And how does this hurt you, Hester? The influence of money and position is a drug to me as it was in my last life. My being a woman now has done nothing to change my desire to control people. Then do you think your motivations were wrong in choosing to be a female? Yes. I do feel more natural living as a man. But I thought as a woman this time around I would be more subtle. I wanted this chance to try again in a different sex, and Clodise let me take it. What a blunder. Don't you think you were being a little hard on yourself? I have the sense you also chose to be a woman because you wanted a woman's insight and intuition to give you a different perspective to tackle your lessons. You can have masculine energy, if you want to call it that, and still be feminine. Why do you think you had no conscious memory about your life as Ross Felden? When we choose a body and make a plan before coming back to Earth, there is an agreement with our advisors not to remember our other lives. Why? Learning from a blank slate is better than knowing in advance what could happen to you because of what you did before. But wouldn't knowing about your past life mistakes be valuable in avoiding the same pitfalls in this life? If people knew all about their past, many might pay too much attention to it rather than trying out new approaches to the same problem. The new life must be taken seriously. Are there any other reasons? Without having old memories, our advisors say there is less preoccupation for trying to avenge the past, to get even for the wrongs done to you. Well, it seems to me that so far this has been part of the motivation and conduct in your life as Hester. That's why I came to you. And do you still think a total blackout of our eternal spiritual life on Earth is essential to progress? Normally, yes. But it's not a total blackout. We get flashes from dreams during times of crisis. People have an inner knowing of what direction to take when it is necessary, and sometimes your friends can give you hints by flashing ideas. I've done it. Nevertheless, you had to come to me to unlock your conscious amnesia. We have the capacity to know when it is necessary. I was ready for change when I heard about you. Bodies allowed me to see the past with you because it was to my benefit. Otherwise, your amnesia would have remained intact? Yes. That would have meant I wasn't supposed to know certain things yet. When orientation is upsetting to a subject... I find an underlying reason is the abruptness with which a soul is once again in full possession of all past knowledge. After physical death, unencumbered by a human body, the soul has a sudden influx of perception. The stupid things we did in life hit us hard in orientation. I see more relaxation and greater clarity of thought as I move my subjects further into the spirit world. Souls are created in a positive matrix of such love and wisdom that when a soul starts to come to a planet like Earth and join the physical beings who have evolved from a primitive state, the violence is a shock. 
Humans have the raw, negative emotions of anger and hate as an outgrowth of their fear and pain connected with survival going back to the Stone Age. Both positive and negative emotions are mixed between soul and host for their mutual benefit. If a soul only knew love and peace, it would gain no insight and never truly appreciate the value of these positive feelings. The test of reincarnation for a soul coming to earth is the conquering of fear in a human body. The soul grows by trying to overcome all negative emotions connected to fear through perseverance in many lifetimes, often returning to the spirit world bruised or hurt. Some of this negativity can be retained, even in the spirit world, and may reappear in another life with a new body. On the other hand, there is a trade-off. It's in joy and unabashed pleasure that the true nature of an individual soul is revealed on earth in the face of a happy human being. All soul evaluation conferences, be they with our guides, peers, or a panel of masters, have one thing in common. The feedback and past life analyses we receive in terms of judgment is based upon the original intent of our choices as much as the actions of a lifetime. Our motivations are questioned and criticized, but not condemned in such a way as to make us suffer. I have been told that our spiritual masters constantly remind us that because the human brain does not have an innate moral sense of ethics, conscience is the soul's responsibility. Nevertheless, there is overwhelming forgiveness in the spirit world. This world is ageless, and so too are our learning tasks. We will be given other chances in our struggle for growth. All souls, regardless of experience, eventually arrive at a central port in the spirit world, which I call the staging area. Once past the orientation station, there seems to be no further travel detours for anyone entering this space of the spirit world. Apparently, large numbers of returning souls are conveyed in a spiritual form of mass transit. The assembly and transfer of souls really involves two phases. The staging area is not an encampment space. Spirits are brought in, collected, and then projected out to their proper final destinations. One of my clients described the staging area as resembling the hub of a great wagon wheel, where we are transported from a center along the spokes to our designated places. The following session was with an insightful 41-year-old graphic designer with a mature soul. This man's soul had traveled over this course many times between a long span of lives. You are now ready to begin the final portion of your homeward journey toward the place where your soul belongs in the spirit world. On the count of three, all the details of this final leg of your travels will become clear to you. It will be easy for you to report on everything you see because you're familiar with the route. Are you ready? Yes. One, we're getting started. Two, your soul has now moved out of the area of orientation. Three, what is your first impression? Distances are unlimited, endless space forever. But when I begin to really move, it changes. Everything remains formless. But when I am gliding faster, I see I'm moving around inside a gigantic bowl turned upside down. Then movement gives you the sense of a spherical spirit world? Yes, but it's only a feeling of enclosed uniformity when I am moving rapidly. Although everything appears to go on straight when my soul is drifting, that changes to a feeling of roundness when I am moving fast on the line of contact. Can you more precisely describe the movement of your soul along these curving contact lines? It's just more purposeful when my soul is being directed someplace on a line. It's like I'm in a current of white water, only not as thick as water because the current is lighter than air. Then, in the spiritual atmosphere, you don't have the sense of density, such as in water? No, I don't. But what I'm trying to say is, I'm being carried along as if I were in a current underwater. Why do you think this is so? Well, it's, it's as if we were all swimming, being carried along, in a swift current which we can't control under somebody's direction, up and down from each other, in space with nothing solid around us. Do you see other souls traveling in a purposeful way above and below you? We are like salmon going up to spawn, returning home. Once we get there, we are not pushed about this way. Then we can drift. Who is doing the pushing while you're being taken home? Higher entities. The ones in charge of our movements to get us home. 
Continue to move further along with the current of energy closer to the area where you're supposed to go. Look around carefully and tell me what you see. I see a variety of lights in patches separated from each other by galleries. By galleries, do you mean a series of enclosures? More like a long corridor bulging out in places, stretching out away from me and in, into the distance. And the lights? They are people. The souls of people within the bulging galleries reflecting light outward to me. That's what I'm seeing. Patches of lights bobbing around. Tell me what separates the light clusters from each other along this corridor you're describing. The people are divided by thin, wispy filaments making the light milky, like the transparency of frosted glass. There is an incandescent glow from their energy as I pass by. How do you see individual souls within the clusters? As light dots. I see masses of dots hanging in clumps, all lit up. They are separated into small groups. I am going to my own clump. What else do you feel about them as you pass by on the way to your cluster? I can feel their thoughts reaching out, so varied, but together, too. Such harmony. Give me an example of what the whole thing looks like to you from a distance. A long glowworm, its sides bulging in and out. The movement is rhythmic. Continue floating and tell me what happens to you next. I'm at the edge of another corridor. I'm slowing down because I'm coming in towards the site where my friends are attached. And how do you feel at this moment? Fantastic. There is a familiar pulling of minds reaching out to me. I'm catching the tail of their kite, joining them in thought. I'm home. When you are moving around as a spirit, what is the major difference in your interactions with other souls compared to being in human form on Earth? Here no one is a stranger. There is a total lack of hostility toward anyone. We recognize a universal bond between us which makes us all the same. There is no suspicion toward each other. How does this attitude manifest itself between souls who first meet? By complete openness and acceptance. Living on Earth must be difficult for souls, then. It is, for the newer ones especially, because they go to Earth expecting to be treated fairly. When they aren't, it's a shock. For some, it takes quite a few lives to get used to the Earth body. And if the newer souls are struggling with these earth conditions, are they less efficient when working within the human mind? I would have to say yes, because the brain drives a lot of fear and violence into our souls. It's hard for us, but that's why we come to earth, to overcome. After souls arrive back into their soul groups, they are summoned to appear before a council of elders. While the council is not prosecutorial, they do engage in direct examination of a soul's activities before returning them to their groups. It is not unusual for my subjects to have some difficulty providing me with full details of what transpires at these hearings, and I'm sure these blocks are intentional. Souls consider themselves having finally arrived home when they rejoin familiar classmates in group settings. Their attendance here with certain other souls does resemble an educational placement system in form and function. The criteria for group admission is based upon knowledge and a given developmental level. As in any classroom situation, some students connect well with teachers and others less so. Secondary groups of souls are arranged in the form of a community support group, which is much less intimate with one another. Large secondary groups of entities are made up of giant sets of primary clusters as lily pads in one pond. Spiritual ponds appear to be endless. Within these ponds, I have never heard of a secondary group estimated at less than a thousand souls. The many primary group clusters which make up one secondary group seem to have sporadic relationships or no contact at all between clusters. It is rare for me to find souls involved with each other in any meaningful way who are members of two different secondary groups because the number of souls is so great it is not necessary. The smaller subgroup primary clusters vary in number, containing anywhere from 3 to 25 souls. I am told the average assemblage is around 15, which is called the inner circle. Any working contact between members of different cluster groups is governed by the lessons to be learned during an incarnation. This may be due to a past life connection or the particular identity trait of the souls involved. Members of the same cluster group are closely united for all eternity. These tightly knit clusters are often composed of like-minded souls with common objectives, 
which they continually work out with each other. Usually, they choose lives together as relatives and close friends during their incarnations on Earth. The next case offers us an account of what it is like coming back to one's cluster group after physical death. Once you leave the staging area and have arrived in the spiritual space where you belong, what do you do then? I go to school with my friends. I want you to take me through this school. Start by telling me what you see from the outside. I see a perfectly square Greek temple with large sculptured columns. Very beautiful. I recognize it because this is where I return after each cycle or, or life. It seems natural since my lives in Greece. All right, let's continue. Does anyone come to meet you? My teacher, Carla. I see her coming out of the entrance of the temple towards me as a goddess, tall, wearing long flowing robes. She reaches out to me. Where are the others? Carla has taken me inside my temple school. I see a large library. Small gatherings of people are speaking in quiet tones at tables. It is a secure feeling which is so familiar to me. Do all these people appear as adult men and women? Yes, but there are more women in my group because that's the gender preference that they are most comfortable with right now. How many people are in this library with you? About 20. We are all close. I've known them for ages, but five are my dearest friends. Are every one of the 20 people at about the same level of learning? Um, almost. Some are a little further along than the rest. Where would you place yourself in the group as far as knowledge? Around the middle. As to learning lessons, where are you in relation to your five closest friends? Oh, we are about the same. We work together a lot. And what do you call them? We have pet names for each other to define our essence. We see each other as representing earth things. What is your pet name? Thistle. I am known for sharp reactions to new situations in my rotation's life cycles. What is the entity you feel closest to called, and why? <laughs> Spray. <laughs> he goes flat out in his rotations, dispensing his energy so rapidly it splashes in all directions, just like the water he loves so much on Earth. Your family group sounds very distinctive. Now, would you explain to me what you and your friends actually do in this library setting? I go to my table, and we all look at the life books. They are picture books, thick white pages, two or three inches thick, quite large. There is no writing. Everything we see is in live pictures. Action pictures? Uh, different than photographs? Yes. They are multidimensional. They move, shift from a center of crystal which changes with reflected light. Tell me how you and your friends use the books. Well, at first it's always out of focus when the book is opened. Then we think of what we want... The crystal turns from dark to light and gets into alignment. Then we can see in miniature our past lives and the alternatives. Take a look at the book and just tell me the first thing you see. A lack of self-discipline in my past life because this is what is on my mind. I see myself dying young in a lover's quarrel. My ending was useless. Do you see future lives in the life book? We can look at future possibilities in small bites only, in the form of lessons. Mostly, these options come later with the help of others. These books are intended to emphasize our past acts. Would you give me your impression of the intent behind this library atmosphere with your cluster group? We all help one another go over our mistakes during this cycle. Our teacher is in and out, and so we do a lot of studying together and discuss the value of our choices. Are you allowed to visit these other buildings where souls study? There is one which we go to regularly, a place for the newer ones. We help them when their teacher is gone. It's nice to be needed. Can you wander about anywhere as long as you don't bother other souls in their study areas? I like to stay around the vicinity of my temple, but I can reach out to anyone. I get the impression that your soul energy is restricted to this spiritual space, even though you can mentally reach out further. I don't feel restricted. We have plenty of room to go about, but I'm not attracted to everyone. It has been said that a human aura reflects thoughts and emotions combined with the physical health of an individual. I wondered if these personal meridians projected by humans had a direct connection to what I was being told about the light emitted by souls in the spirit world. From information gathered during the following session, I realized that radiated soul light visualized by spirits is not all white. 
In the minds of my subjects, every soul generates a specific color aura. I credited this case with helping me decipher the meaning of these manifestations of energy. All right, let's float outside your temple of study. What do you see around you or off in the distance? People. Large gatherings of people. I can't count. Hundreds and hundreds. There are so many. And do you identify with all these souls? Are you associated with them? Not really. I can't even see all of them. It's sort of fuzzy out there, but my gang is near me. If I could call your gang of about 20 souls your primary cluster group, are you associated with the larger secondary body of souls around you now? We are all associated, but not directly. I don't know those others. Do you see any teacher guides? Some, yes. There are much fewer of them than us, of course. I can see Carla with two of her friends. You can look out there at all the bright white lights and just mentally tell they are guides? Sure we can do that. But they are not all white. You mean souls are not all absolutely white? That's partially true. The intensity aspect of our energy can make us less brilliant. So Carla and her friends display different shades of white? No, they aren't white at all. I don't follow you. Carla and her two friends are teachers and radiate yellow. Oh, so all guides radiate yellow energy? No, they don't. Carla's teacher is Valère's. He is blue. We see him sometimes here. Nice guy. Very smart. I'm confused. You didn't say anything about another teacher called Valère's being part of your group. You didn't ask me. Anyway, he is not in my group. Neither is Carla. They have their own groups. And these guides have auras which are yellow and blue? Yes. I'm curious about Valère's. Does every spiritual group have two teachers assigned to their cluster? Hmm. It varies. Carla trains under Valère's, so we have two. We see little of him. He works with other groups besides us. So, Carla herself is student teaching as a less advanced guide? She is advanced enough for me. Okay. But will you help me straighten out these color schemes? Why is Carla's energy radiating yellow and Valère's blue? That's easy. Valère's precedes all of us in knowledge, and he gives off a darker intensity of light. Does the shade of blue compared to yellow or plain white make a difference between souls? I'm trying to tell you. Blue is deeper than yellow, and yellow is more intense than white, depending on how far along you are. And how does Carla's yellow color vary from your whiteness in terms of where you are going with your own advancement? I'm turning into a reddish white. Eventually, I'll have light gold. Recently, I've noticed Carla turning a little darker yellow. I expected it. She is so knowledgeable and good. Really? And, and then will she eventually take her energy level to dark blue in intensity? No, to a light blue at first. It's always gradual as our energy becomes more dense. So, these three basic lights of white, yellow, and blue represent the development stages of souls and are visibly obvious to all spirits? That's right. And the changes are very slow. I have never worked with a subject in trance who did not have a personal guide. Some guides are more in evidence than others during hypnosis sessions. It is my custom to ask subjects if they see or feel a discarnate presence in the room. If they do, this third party is usually a protective guide. Often, a client will sense the presence of a discarnate figure before visualizing a face or hearing a voice. People who meditate a great deal are naturally more familiar with these visions than someone who has never called upon his or her guide. The recognition of these spiritual teachers brings people into the company of a warm, loving, creative power. Through our guides, we become more acutely aware of the continuity of life and our identity as a soul. Guides are figures of grace in our existence because they are part of the fulfillment of our destiny. When souls progress as guides, are they given quite a few souls to work with? Only the more practiced ones. Once you attain competency and success as a teacher, the number of souls you are given doesn't matter. Some clusters have lots of souls and others don't. So if you are a senior, you have the ability to handle large numbers of souls? I didn't exactly say that. Much depends upon the types of souls in a section and the experience of the leaders. In the larger sections, they have help too, you know. Who does? The guides you are calling seniors. Well, who helps them? The overseers. Now they are the real pros. 
I have heard them also called master teachers. That's not a bad description for them. What energy color do they project to you? It's purplish. Well, define for me why souls are selected as guides. They must be compassionate without being too easy on you. They aren't judgmental. You don't have to do things their way. They don't restrain by imposing their values on you. What are the important things they do as you see it? They build morale in their sections and instill confidence. We all know they have been through a lot themselves. We are accepted for who we are as individuals with the right to make our own mistakes. They never give up on you. What would you say is the most important attribute of any guide? The ability to motivate you and instill courage. My friend's junior guide appears in the form of a kindly, nurturing Native American medicine woman called Quan. Dressed simply in a deerskin sheath, her long hair pulled back, Quan's soft face is bathed in vivid light during her appearances. Quan's desire to lighten the load of the rather difficult life my friend has chosen is tempered by a challenging male figure called Giles. Giles is clearly a senior guide who may be close to being a master in the spirit world. In this capacity, he does not appear nearly as often as Quan. When Giles does come into my friend's higher consciousness, he does so abruptly. He is a sample of how a senior guide operates differently from one of junior status. When you are in deep reflection over a serious problem, how does Giles come to you? Not the same as Quan, I can tell you. Usually, he likes to hide a little at first behind a shadow of blue vapor. I hear him chuckling before I see him. When he shows himself, what does Giles look like to you? An elf figure. Tangled hair all over his wrinkled face. He looks a mess and moves constantly in all directions. Giles is a slippery character, impatient too. He frowns a lot while he paces back and forth in front of me with his arms clasped in back of him. And how would you interpret this behavior? Giles is not dignified like some guides, but he is very clever, crafty. Could you be more specific as to how this conduct relates to you? Giles has made me look upon my lives as a chess game with the earth as the board. I plan, and then things go wrong during the game in my life. I sometimes think he lays traps for me to work through on the board. Do you prosper with this technique of your advanced guide? More afterward, here in the spirit world. But he makes me work so damn hard on earth. Could you get rid of him and just work with Quan? It doesn't work that way here. Besides, he is brilliant. So, we don't get to choose our guides? No way. They choose you. Do you have an idea why you have two guides who approach your problems so differently in the way they help you? No, I don't, but I consider myself very fortunate. Quan is gentle and steady with her support. Some of your feelings about Quan and Giles for me. I love Quan as a mother, but I wouldn't be where I am without Giles' discipline. They are both skillful because they allow me to benefit from mistakes. People want to know if their guides always come whenever they call for help. Guides are not consistent in the manner in which they choose to assist us because they carefully evaluate how badly they are needed. I am also asked if hypnosis is the best way to get in contact with one's guide. Naturally, I lean toward hypnosis because I know how potent and effective this medium can be to obtain detailed spiritual information. However, hypnosis by a trained facilitator is not convenient on a daily basis, where meditation, prayer, and perhaps channeling with another person would be. Self-hypnosis, as a form of deep meditation, is an excellent alternative and may be preferred by those who have a fear of being hypnotized by others or don't want the interference of a second party in their spiritual life. Regardless of the method used, we all have the capacity to send out far-reaching thought waves from our higher consciousness. Every person's thoughts represent a mental fingerprint to guides marking who and where we are. During our lives, especially in periods of great stress, most people feel the presence of someone watching out for them. We may not be able to describe this power, but it is there nonetheless. There are two types of beginner soul. Souls who are truly young in terms of exposure to an existence out of the spirit world, and souls who have been reincarnating on earth for a long period of relative time, but still remain immature. The next case represents an absolute beginner soul. This novice shows no evidence of having a spiritual group assignment as yet. 
because she has lived too few past lives. In her first life, she was killed in 1260 A.D. in northern Syria by a Mongol invasion. Her name was Shabez, and her settlement was sacked, resulting in a terrible massacre of the inhabitants when she was five years old. Shabez, now that you have died and returned to the spirit world, tell me what you feel. Cheated. That life was so cruel. I couldn't stay. I was only a little girl unable to help anybody. What a mistake. Who made this mistake? My leader. I trusted his judgment, but he was wrong to send me into that cruel life to be killed before my life got started. But you did agree to come into the body of Shabez. I didn't know Earth would be such an awful place full of terror. I wasn't given all the facts. The whole stupid life was a mistake, and my leader is responsible. Didn't you learn anything from this life? I started to learn to love, yes. That was wonderful. My brother, parents, but it was so short. Did anything good come out of this life? My brother Ahmed, to be with him. Is Ahmed in your present life? I can't believe it. Ahmed is my husband, Bill. The same person. How can I... Do you see Ahmed on your return to the spirit world after dying as Shabazz? Yes. Our leader brings us together here where we stay. Describe what you do here. While our leader comes and goes, Ahmed and I just work together. We search out what we think about ourselves, our experience on Earth. I'm still sore about us being killed so soon. But there was happiness walking in the sun, love. Well, go back further to the time before you and Ahmed had your life together, perhaps when you were alone. Do you remember during your own creation when you first began to think as an intelligent being? I realized I existed, but I didn't know myself as myself until I was moved into this quiet place alone with Ahmed. Keep to the time before Ahmed. What was it like for you then? Warm, nurturing, my mind opening... She was with me then. She? I thought your leader displayed a male gender to you. I don't mean him. Someone was around me with the presence of a mother and father, mostly mother. Who actually created you and Ahmed? The one. Once our souls advance into the intermediate ranges of development, group cluster activity is considerably reduced. This does not mean we return to the kind of isolation we saw with the novice soul. Souls evolving into the middle development levels have less association with primary groups because they have acquired the maturity and experience for operating more independently. These souls are also reducing the number of their incarnations. Within intermediate and upper intermediate levels, we are at last ready for some serious responsibilities. The relationship we have with our guides now changes from teacher-student to one of colleagues working together. Since our old guides have acquired new student groups, it is now our turn to develop teaching skills which will eventually qualify us for the responsibilities of being a guide to someone else. Despite their high standards of morality and conduct, entities who have reached the intermediate levels of maturity are modest about their achievements. Naturally, each case is different, but I notice more composure with clients in this stage and above. I see trust rather than suspicion toward the motives of others on both a conscious and subconscious level. These people demonstrate a forward-looking attitude of faith and confidence for the future of humanity, which encourages those around them. My next case falls into the upper portion of intermediate-level development, radiating a yellow energy devoid of any reddish tones. This client was a small, nondescript man nearly 50 years old. The most striking feature about him was his dark, morose eyes, which grew more intense as he began to talk about himself in a direct and persuasive manner. He told me he worked for a charitable organization dispensing food to the homeless, and that he had once been a journalist. This client had traveled quite some distance to discuss with me his concern over a decline in enthusiasm for his work. He said he was tired and wanted to spend the rest of his life quietly alone. His first session involved a review of the highlights of many past lives so he could better evaluate a proper course for the remainder of his current life. I talked to my client about his current life and his customary methods of learning in previous lives. He explained he had never been married and that social non-alignments worked best for him. I suggested a few alternatives for his consideration. Primarily, I felt his lack of intimacy with people in too many lives was obstructing his progress. When the session ended, he was anxious that we explore his mind further for perceptions about the spirit world in another session. Upon his arrival the next day, I placed him in a superconscious state, and we went back to work. 
by what name are you called in the spirit world? I am called Nentham. Nentham, do you have spirits around you right now, or are you alone? I am with two of my longtime companions, Raoul and Senji. And are the three of you part of a larger spiritual group of souls working together? We were, but now the three of us work more by ourselves. What are the three of you doing at this moment? We are discussing the best ways to help each other during our incarnations. Well, tell me what you do for each other. I help Senji to forgive herself for mistakes and appreciate her own worth. She needs to stop being a mother figure all the time on Earth. How does she assist you? To see my lack of sense of belonging. Give me an example of Senji's actions to assist you with this issue. Well, she was my wife in Japan after my days as a warrior were over. Raoul likes to pair with Senji and I am usually alone. What about Raoul? How do you two help each other? I help him with patience and he helps me with my tendency to avoid community life. Are you always two males and a female in your incarnations on Earth? No, we can change and do, but this is comfortable for us. Why are the three of you working independently from the rest of your spiritual group? Oh, we see them here. Some have not gone forward with us. A few others are further ahead of us in their tasks. Do you have a guide or teacher? She is Idis. It sounds to me as if you have a high regard for her. Do you communicate well with Idis? Yes, I do. Not that we don't have our disagreements. She doesn't reincarnate much, and I tell her she should have more direct exposure to current conditions on Earth. Aside from her teaching techniques, are you fond of Idis in terms of her identity? Yes. I just wish she would agree to come with me once. Oh, you would like to actually have an Earth incarnation with her? I have told her we might relate better here if she would consent to come to Earth sometime and mate with me. She laughs and says she will think about it, if I can prove to her that it would be productive. Nentham, can you tell me if Idis is preparing you to be a guide, assuming you have an interest in that activity? I do have an interest. Oh, then are you developing as a guide yourself? I'm really no more than a caretaker, helping Idis and taking directions. Do you try and imitate her teaching style? No, we are different. As an apprentice, a caretaker, I couldn't do what she is able to accomplish anyway. When did you know you were ready to be a caretaker and begin assisting others spiritually? It's an awareness which comes over you after a great number of lives that you are more in balance with yourself than previously and are able to aid people as a spirit and in the flesh. Are you operating in or out of the spirit world as a caretaker at this time? I am out in two lives. Where are you living in this other life? Canada. I picked a poor family in a rural community where I would be more indispensable. I'm in a small mountain town. Give me the details of this Canadian life and your responsibilities. I'm taking care of my brother Billy. His face and hands were horribly burned by a flash fire from a kitchen stove when he was four years old. He is almost blind and his facial disfigurement causes him to be rejected by the community. I try to open him to an acceptance of life and to know who he really is from the inside. I read to him and go for walks in the forest holding his arm. I don't hold his hands because they are so damaged. What about your Canadian parents? I am the parent. My father left after the fire and never came back. My mother's soul is not very capable in her body. They need someone with seasoning. Someone physically strong? <laughs> no, I'm a woman in Canada. I'm Billy's sister. My mother and brother require someone mentally tough to hold the family together and give them a course to follow. How do you provide for the family? I am a baker and I'll never marry because I can't leave them. Did you know in advance your brother was going to be incapacitated before you came into the Canadian life? Sure. Idis and I discussed the whole situation. She said Billy's soul would require a caretaker, and since I had negative contact with this soul before in another life, I welcomed the job. Besides the karmic lesson for Billy's soul, there are some for you, too, in terms of your being in the role of a woman who is tied down. That's true. The degree of difficulty in a life is measured by how challenging the situation is for you, not others. Give me the most difficult factor of this assignment for you as a caretaker. To sustain a child through their helplessness to adulthood. To teach a child to confront torment with courage. Billy's life is an extreme example, but it does seem Earth's children have much physical and emotional pain to go through. Did Idis encourage or discourage you wanting to accelerate development by living parallel lives? 
She is always open about this. I haven't done it too much in the past. Why not? Life combinations can be tiring and divisive. The effort may become counterproductive with diminished returns for both lives. Well, I see that you are helping people in both your lives today, but have you ever lived contrasting lives where you did poorly in one life and better in another at the same time? Yes, although that was a long time ago on Earth. This is one of the advantages of life combinations. One life can offset the other. Still, doing this can be rough going. I have the impression you think the average soul is better off living one life at a time. I would say yes in most instances, but the rewards for bunching up lives can allow for more reflection out of incarnation. You mean the rest periods between lives might last longer for us after concurrent lives? Sure, it takes longer to reflect on two lives than one. Nentham, I want to turn now to your activities in the spirit world when you are not so busy with earth incarnations, interacting in soul groups, and learning to be a guide. Can you tell me of other spiritual areas in which you are occupied? Yes, there are other areas. I know of them. What would you call these areas of activity? The world without ego, the world of all knowing, the world of creation and non-creation, and the world of altered time. Are they worlds which exist in our physical universe? One does. The rest are non-dimensional spheres of attention. What is the world without ego? It's the place of learning to be. The newly created soul is there to learn who they are. It's the place of origin. Are the ego identities passed out at random, or is there a choice for beginner souls? The new soul is not capable of choice. You acquire your character based upon the way your energy is combined, put together for you. So the purpose of this world is the distribution of soul identity by advanced beings. Yes. The new soul is pure energy with no real self yet. The world without ego provides you with a signature. Then why do you call it the world without ego? Because the newly created souls arrive with no ego, the idea of self has not come into the new soul's consciousness. It is here where the soul is offered meaning to its existence. When you acquired your particular identity as a soul, did that automatically mean you were slated for Earth incarnations in human form? Not specifically, no. Planets don't last forever. In your beginnings, were you given the opportunity to choose other planetary hosts besides humans on Earth? As a new soul, the guides assist in those selections. I was drawn to human beings. Were you given other choices? Yes, but it's not very clear at the moment. They usually start you on an easy world or two without much to do. Then I was offered service on this severe planet. Earth is considered severe. Oh, yes, on some worlds you must overcome physical discomforts, even suffering. Others lean toward mental contests. Earth has both. We get kudos for doing well on the hard worlds. We are called the adventurous ones by those who don't travel much. What really appeals to you about Earth? The kinship humans have for each other while they struggle against one another, competing and collaborating at the same time. Humans also have a great capacity for malevolence. That's part of the passion, but it's evolving too. And when humans experience trouble, they can be at their best and are quite noble. Perhaps it is the soul which fosters the positive characteristics you suggested. We try to enhance what is already there. How would you compare the world without ego to the world of all knowing? They are opposites. This world is not for young souls. Have you been to the world of all knowing? No, I'm not ready. I am only aware of it as a place we strive for. What do you know about this spiritual area? It is a place of contemplation, the ultimate mental world of planning and design. I can tell you little about this sphere except it is the final destination of all thought. The senses of all living things are coordinated here. Then the world of all knowing is abstract in the highest form. Yes, it's about blending content with form, the rational with ideals. It is a dimension where the realization of all our hopes and dreams is possible. If the world without ego and the world of all knowing are at opposite ends of a soul's experience, then where does the world of altered time fall? This sphere is available to all souls because it represents their own physical world. In my case, it is Earth. Oh, this must be the physical dimension you told me about. No, the sphere of Earth is only simulated for my use. Why do you call this third sphere the world of altered time? 
because we can change time sequences to study specific events. What is the basic purpose of doing this? To improve my decisions for life. This study makes me more discriminating and prepares me for the world of all-knowing. We haven't talked about the world of creation and non-creation. This must be the three-dimensional physical world you spoke of earlier. Yes, and we enjoy using it as well. Is this world intended for the use of all souls? No, it is not. I'm just starting to apply myself there. I'm considered a newcomer. Well, before we get into that, I want to ask if this physical world is the same as Earth. No, it's a little different. It's larger and somewhat colder. There is less water, fewer oceans, but similar. Is this planet further from its sun than Earth is from our sun? Yes. If I could call this physical world Earth 2, since it seems to be geographically similar to the Earth we know, would it be near Earth 1 in the sky? No. Is Earth 2 in our Milky Way galaxy? No, I think it's further away. I suppose you go to Earth 2 to reincarnate with some sort of intelligent being? No, that's just what we don't want to do there. Well, when do you go to Earth 2? Between my lives on this Earth. Why do you go to Earth 2? We go there to create and just enjoy ourselves as free spirits. And you don't bother the inhabitants of Earth 2? There are no people. It's so peaceful. We roam among the forests, the deserts, and over oceans with no responsibilities. What is the highest form of life on Earth 2? Oh, small animals without much intelligence. Do animals have souls? Yes, all living things do, but they have very simple fragments of mind energy. And all categories of living things are separated from each other? No, the Maker's energy joins the units of every living thing in existence. Are you involved with this element of creation? Oh, no. Well, who is selected to visit Earth, too? Those of us who are connected with Earth come here. This is a vacation spot compared to Earth. There is no fighting, bickering, or striving for supremacy. There is a pristine atmosphere, and all life is quiet. This place gives us an incentive to return to Earth and make it more peaceful, too. I see how this Garden of Eden would allow you to rest and be carefree, but you also said you come here to create. Yes, we do. We can experiment with creation and see it developing here. Start with your arrival on Earth, too, and explain to me what your soul does first. I look to see what I'm supposed to make on the ground in front of me. Then I mold the object in my mind and try and create the same thing with small doses of energy. The teachers assist us with control. I'm supposed to see my mistakes and make corrections. Who are the teachers? I descend. There are other instructors around. I don't know them very well. Try to be as clear as possible. What exactly are you doing? I experiment with basic elements, you know, hydrogen and oxygen, to create planetary substance, rocks, air, water, keeping everything very small. I take the basic elements and charge them with impulses from my energy, and they can change. Change into what? I'm good with rocks. I want to understand this clearly. Your work consists of learning to create by causing heat, pressure, and cooling from your energy flow? That's about right. By alternating our currents of energy radiation. So you don't actually produce the substance of rock and water in some chemical way? No, like I told you. My job is to transform things by mixing what I am given. I play with the frequency and dosages of my energy. It's tricky, but not too complicated. Not complicated? I thought nature did these things. <laughs> who do you think nature is? Well, who creates the basic elements of your experiments, the primary substances of physical matter? The maker and those creating on a grander scale than me. So it sounds like souls playing as children in a sandbox with toys. <laughs> we are children. Directing an energy flow resembles the sculpting of clay. If we are all working up the ladder of development as souls, Nentham, I'm left with the impression the spirit world is one huge organizational pyramid with a supreme authority of power at the top. Ooh, no, you're wrong. This is not a pyramid. We are all threads in the same long piece of fabric. We are all woven into it. It's hard for me to visualize fabric when there are so many levels of competency for souls. Think of it as a moving continuum rather than the souls being in brackets of highs and lows. From what I am able to determine, souls are expected to begin familiarizing themselves with the forces of creation by the time they are solidly established in the intermediate level. 
The formation of inanimate to animate objects from the simple to the complex is a long, slow process. Students are encouraged to create miniature planetary microhabitats for a given set of organisms which can adapt to certain environmental conditions. With practice comes improvement, but not until they approach the advanced level do my clients begin to feel they might actually contribute to the development of living things. Some souls seem to have a natural gift for working with energy in their creation classes. My cases indicate ability in creation assignments does not mean a soul is at the same level of advancement in all other areas of the spiritual curricula. A soul may be a good technician in harnessing the forces of creation, but lack the subtle techniques of a competent guide. Perhaps this is why I have been given the impression that the highly advanced soul is allowed to specialize. The mark of an advanced spirit is one who has patience with society and shows extraordinary coping skills. They may be found in all walks of life, but are frequently in the helping professions or combating social injustice in some fashion. The advanced soul radiates composure, kindness, and understanding toward others. Not being motivated by self-interest, they may disregard their own physical needs and live in reduced circumstances. The individual I have chosen to represent the advanced soul is a woman in her mid-thirties who works for a large medical treatment facility specializing in chemical substance abuse. I was introduced to this woman by a colleague who told me of her skill in guiding recovering drug addicts into an improved state of self-awareness. At our first meeting, I was struck by the woman's expression of serenity while surrounded by chaotic emergencies at her place of employment. Although warm and friendly, there was about her an air of impenetrability. Her clear, luminous gray eyes were those of one who sees small things unnoticed by ordinary folk. I felt she was looking into rather than at me. My colleague suggested the three of us have lunch because this woman was interested in my studies of the spirit world. She told me that she had never been hypnotically regressed, but there was the sense of a long spiritual genealogy through her own meditations. She thought our meeting was no accident on her own learning path, and we came to an agreement to explore her spiritual knowledge. A few weeks later, she arrived at my office. She rapidly entered into a deep trance and made instant contact with her inner self. Almost at once, I found this woman's span of incarnation staggering, going far back into the distant past of human life on earth. Touching on her earliest memories, I came to the conclusion her first lives occurred at the beginning of the last warm interglacial period, which lasted from 130,000 to 70,000 years ago, before the last great ice age spread over the planet. During the warmer climate of the Middle Paleolithic period of Earth's history, my subject described living in moist, subtropical savannas near hunting, fishing, and plant-gathering areas. Later, some 50,000 years ago, when continental sheets of ice had again changed Earth's climate, she spoke of living in caves and enduring bitter cold. I now send my subject into an African life around 9,000 years ago, which she said was an important milestone in her advancement. This was the last life she was to spend with her guide, Kumara. Kumara was an advanced soul herself at the time of this life, counseling a benevolent tribal chief as his influential wife. I tentatively located their land as the highlands of Ethiopia. Apparently, my subject had known Kumara in a number of earlier lives, covering thousands of years during Kumara's final incarnations on earth. Their association in human form ended when my subject died, saving Kumara's life on a riverboat by throwing herself in front of an enemy spear. What is your spiritual name? Thies. And your spiritual guide kept her African name of Kumara? For me, yes. What exactly is the color of your energy? Sky blue with some flecks of gold. Not much. Kumara's energy color is violet. Where does the highest intensity of intelligent light energy originate from? The knowledge by which the energy of darker light is extended to us comes from the source. Our light is attached to the source. When you say source, you mean God? That word has been misused. Perhaps we should talk about older souls for a minute. Does Kumara incarnate on Earth anymore? No, she doesn't. Do you know others like Kumara who were here during the early times on Earth and don't come back anymore? A few, yes. 
Many got on earth early and got off before I came. Did any advanced soul keep coming back to life on earth when they could stay in the spirit world? Oh, you mean the sages? They are the true watchers of earth, you know, to be here and keep watch over what is going on. Don't the sages get tired of still hanging around earth? They choose to stay and help people directly because they are dedicated to earth. They live simple lives. I first came to know some of them thousands of years ago. Today it's hard to see them. They don't like cities much. What is the feeling one gets when meeting a sage on earth? You feel a special presence. Their power of understanding and the advice they give you is so wise. They do live simply. Material things mean nothing to them. Perhaps the word sage could also be applied to souls like Kumara, or even with the entities to whom she turns for knowledge. No, they are different. They are beyond the sages. We call them the old ones. Are there many old ones working with souls at Kumara's level and above? I don't think so, compared to the rest of us. But we feel their influence. Could the old ones be embodiments of the source itself? It is not for me to say, but I don't think so yet. They must be close to the source. The old ones represent the purest elements of thought, engaging in the planning and arranging of substances. When a species of life evolves on a planet, are the environmental conditions for selection and adaptation natural, or are intelligent soul minds tinkering with what happens? Usually a planet hospitable to life has souls watching, and whatever we do is natural. How can souls watch and influence biological properties of growth evolving over millions of years on a primordial world? Time is not in Earth years for us. We use it to suit our experiments. Do you personally create suns in our universe? A full-scale sun? Oh, no, that's way over my head and requires the powers of many. I generate only on a small scale. Well, what can you generate? Uh, small bundles of highly concentrated matter, heated. But what does your work look like when you are finished? Small solar systems. Are your miniature suns and planets the size of rocks, uh, buildings, the moon? My suns are the size of basketballs and the planets marbles. That's the best I can do. Why do you do this on a small scale? For practice, so I can make larger suns. After enough compression, the atoms explode and condense, but I can't do anything really big alone. What do you mean? We must learn to work together to combine our energy for the best results. Well, who does the full-sized thermonuclear explosions which create physical universes and space itself? The source. The concentrated energy of the old ones. Why is your energy striving to create universal matter and more complex life when Kumara and the entities above her are already proficient? We are expected to join them, just as they wish to unite their accomplished energy with the old ones. Creation questions always evoke the issue of first cause. Was the exploding interstellar mass which caused the birth of our stars and planets an accident of nature or planned by an intelligent force? When I listen to subjects such as these, I ask myself why souls would be practicing the chain reactions of energy matter with models on a small scale if they were not intending to make larger celestial bodies. It would seem if souls do progress, then entities at this level could be expected to involve themselves with the birthing of planets and the development of life forms capable of higher intelligence suitable for soul use. After pondering why less than perfect souls are associated with creation at all, I came to the following conclusion. All souls are given the opportunity to participate in the development of lower forms of intelligent life in order to advance themselves. This principle could also be applied to the reason why souls incarnate in physical form. Thies suggested that the supreme intelligence she calls the source is made up of a combination of creators, the old ones, who fuse their energy to spawn universes. The thought has been expressed to me in different ways by other subjects when they describe the combined power of non-reincarnating old souls. From what I can gather from subjects willing and able to discuss former assignments, Souls are sent to any world with suitable intelligent life forms. Out of all the stars which are known to us, only 4% are like our sun. Apparently, this means nothing to souls. Their planetary incarnations are not linked to Earth-type worlds or with intelligent bipeds who walk on land. 
Souls who have been to other worlds tell me they have a fondness for certain ones and return to them, like Earth, periodically for a succession of lives. I have not had many subjects who are able to recall specific details about living on other worlds. This may be due to lack of experience, a suppression of memory, or blocks imposed by master guides to avoid any discomfort from flashbacks in non-earthly bodies. Please, I want you to turn your mind once again to the Source Creator. You said the ultimate objective of souls was to seek unification with the supreme source of creative energy. Do you remember? The act of conjunction, yes. Well, tell me, does the Source dwell in some special central space in the spirit world? The Source is the spirit world. Then why do souls speak of reaching a core of spiritual life? When we are young spirits, we sense power around us everywhere, and yet we feel we are on the edge of it. As we grow older, there is an awareness of a concentrated power, but it is the same feeling. Even though you have called this the place of the old ones? Yes. They are part of the concentrated power of the source which sustains us as souls. Well, lumping this power together as one energy source, can you describe the Creator in more human terms? As the ultimate selfless being which we strive to be. If the source represents all the spirit world, how does this mental place differ from physical universes with stars, planets, and living things? Universes are created to live and die for the use of the source. The place of spirits is the source. We seem to live in a universe which is expanding and may contract again and eventually die. Since we live in a space with time limitations, how can the spirit world itself be timeless? Because here we live in non-space, which is timeless, except in certain zones. Well, please explain what these zones are. They are interconnecting doors, openings for us to pass through into a physical universe of time. The openings exist as thresholds between realities. Do past, present, and future have any relevance for souls living in the spirit world? Only as a means of understanding succession in physical form. Living here, there is a changelessness for those of us not crossing thresholds into a universe of substance and time. Are you saying souls can enter various rooms of different physical realities from spiritual doorways? Yes, they can. And do. When my subjects speak of traveling as souls on lines which curve, I think of the space-time theories of those astrophysicists who believe light and motion are a union of time and space curving back on itself. They say if space is bent severely enough, time stops. Indeed, when listening to my clients talk about time zones and tunnels of passage into different dimensions, I think about the similarities here to current astronomical theories of physical space being warped or twisted into cosmic loops creating mouths of hyperspace and black holes, which may lead out of our three-dimensional universe. Perhaps the space-time concepts of astrophysics and metaphysics are edging closer together. Although my cases are unable to fully explain the place where their souls live, they are all outspoken about its ultimate reality for them. A subject in trance doesn't see the spirit world as being either near or far away from our physical universe. Nevertheless, in a curious way, they do portray spiritual substance as being light or heavy, thick or thin, and large or small when comparing their experiences as souls to life on earth. While the absolute reality of the spirit world appears to remain constant in the minds of people in hypnosis, their references to other physical dimensions do not. I have the sense that universes other than our own are created for the purpose of providing environments suitable for the growth of souls with beings we can't even imagine. One advanced subject told me he had lived on a number of worlds in his long existence, never dividing his soul more than twice at one time. Some adult lives lasted only months in Earth time for him, due to local planetary conditions and short lifespans of the dominant life form. While speaking of a paradise planet, with few people and a quieter, simpler version of Earth, he added this world was not far from Earth. Oh, I interrupted, then it must only be a few light years from Earth? He patiently explained that the planet was not in our universe, but closer to Earth than many planets in our own galaxy. 
Thies, I want to close by asking you more about the source. You have been a soul for a long time, so how do you see yourself relating to the oneness of creation you told me about earlier? By sensations of movement. In the beginning, there is an outward migration of our soul energy from the source. Afterward, our lives are spent moving inward toward cohesion and the uniting. You make this process seem as though a living organism was expanding and contracting. There is an explosive release, then a returning. Yes, the source pulsates. And you are moving toward the center of this energy source? There really is no center. The source is all around us as if we were inside a beating heart. Perhaps you could describe this energy source through the use of colors to explain soul movement and the scope of creation. It's as if souls are all part of a massive electrical explosion which produces a halo effect. In this circular halo is a dark purple light which flares out, lightening to a whiteness at the edges. Our awareness begins at the edges of brilliant light, and as we grow, we become more engulfed in the darker light. What was it like when you were first aware of your identity as a soul after being pushed out to the rim of this halo? To be is the same as watching the first flower of spring open, and the flower is you. And as it opens more, you become aware of other flowers in a glorious field, and there is unbounded joy. If this explosive, multicolored energy source collapses in on itself, will all the flowers eventually die? Nothing is collapsing. The source is endless. As souls, we will never die. We know that, somehow. As we coalesce, our increasing wisdom makes the source stronger. Why does the source, who is ostensibly perfect already, need to create further intelligence which is less than perfect? To help the Creator create. In this way, by self-transformation and rising to higher plateaus of fulfillment, we add to the building blocks of life. There comes that time when the soul must once again leave the sanctuary of the spirit world for another trip to Earth. This decision is not an easy one. Souls must prepare to leave a world of total wisdom where they exist in a blissful state of freedom for the physical and mental demands of a human body. The rejuvenation of our energy and personal assessment of one's self takes longer for some souls than others, but eventually the soul is motivated to start the process of incarnation. While our spiritual environment is hard to leave, as souls we also remember the physical pleasures of life on earth with fondness and even nostalgia. When the wounds of a past life are healed and we are again totally at one with ourselves, we feel the pull of having a physical expression for our identity. Training sessions with our counselors and peer groups have provided a collaborative spiritual effort to prepare us for the next life. Our karma of past deeds towards humanity and our mistakes and achievements have all been evaluated with an eye toward the best course of future endeavors. The soul must now assimilate all this information and take purposeful action based upon three primary decisions. Am I ready for a new physical life? What specific lessons do I want to undertake to advance my learning and development? Where should I go and who shall I be in my next life for the best opportunity to work on my goals? It has been argued these increases in soul incarnations only appear to be so because past life recall improves as people in hypnosis get closer to their current lives. This may be true to some extent, but if a life is important, it will be vividly remembered at any age in time. Without doubt, the enormous population increase on Earth is the basic cause for souls coming here more often. Is there a possibility that the inventory of souls slated for Earth could be strained by this surge in human reproduction? When do you first realize that you might be returning to Earth? A soft voice comes into my mind and says, It's about time, don't you think? Who is this voice? My instructor. Do you feel you are about ready to return to Earth? Yes, I think so. I have prepared for it. But my studies are going to take such a long time in Earth years before I'm done. It's kind of overwhelming. And do you think you will still be going to Earth when you near the end of your incarnations? Um, maybe no. There is another world besides Earth, but with Earth people. What does this mean? 
Earth will have fewer people, less crowded. It's not clear to me. Do you know of anyone who didn't want to be reborn again on Earth for any reason? Yes, my friend Mark. He said he had nothing to contribute anymore. He was sick of life on Earth and didn't want to go back. Had he lived many lives? No, not really, but he wasn't adjusting well in them. What did the teachers do with him? Was he allowed to stay in the spirit world? We choose to be reborn when it is decided we are ready. They don't force you to do anything. Mark was shown he did benefit others around him. What happened to Mark? After some more indoctrination, Mark realized he had been wrong about his abilities, and finally he went back to Earth. Indoctrination? This makes me think of coercion. It's not that way at all. Mark was just discouraged and needed the confidence to keep trying. If the guides don't force you, could a soul absolutely refuse to be reborn? Yes, I guess you could stay here and never be reborn if you hated it that much. But the instructors told Mark that without life in a body, his studies would take longer. If you lose having direct experience, you miss a great deal. How about the reverse situation where a soul insists on returning to Earth immediately, say after an untimely death? I have seen that, too. It's an impulsive reaction and does wear off after a while. The instructors get you to see that wanting to hurry back someplace as a new baby wouldn't change the circumstances of your death. It might be different if you could be reborn as an adult right away in the same situation. Eventually, everyone realizes they must rest and reflect. Well, give me your final thoughts about the prospect of living again. Oh, I'm excited about it. I would have no satisfaction without my physical lives. After you have made the decision you want to come back to Earth, what happens next? Well, when my trainer and I agree the time is right to accomplish things, I send out thoughts. My messages are received by the coordinators. Who are they? Doesn't your trainer guide handle all the arrangements for incarnation? Not exactly. He talks to the coordinators who actually assist us in previewing our life possibilities at the ring. What is the ring? That's where I'm going. We call it the ring of destiny. All right, let's go to the ring together on the count of three. One, two, three. Your soul is now moving toward the space of life selection. Explain what you see. I am floating towards the ring. It's circular, a monster bubble. There is a concentrated energy force. The light is so intense. I'm being sucked inward through a funnel. It's a little darker. As you float inside the ring, what are your first impressions? I'm a little apprehensive, but the energy relaxes me. I have an awareness of concern for me, caring. I don't feel alone. My trainer's presence is with me, too. Continue to report everything. What do you see next? The ring is surrounded by banks of screens. I am looking at them. They appear as walls themselves, but nothing is really solid. It's all elastic. The screens curve around me, moving. I feel a moment of quietness. It's always like this. Then it's as if someone flipped a switch on the projector in a panorama movie theater. The screens come alive with images and there is color, action full of light and sound. Where is your soul in relation to the screens? I am hovering in the middle, watching the panorama of life all around me. I know this city. What do you see? New York. Did you ask to see New York City? We talked about my going back there. I'll come back to New York in a few minutes. Right now, I want you to tell me what is expected of you in the ring. I'm going to mentally operate the panel. What's that? A scanning device in front of the screens. I see it as a mass of lights and buttons. It's as if I'm in the cockpit of an airplane. I will help the controllers change the images on the screens by operating the scanner with my mind. Oh, you're going to operate the projector as if you were working in a movie theater. My commands are registered on the panel so I can track the action. I see lines converging along various points in a series of scenes. I'm traveling through time now on the lines and watching the images on the screens change. And the scenes are constantly moving around you? Yes. Then the points light up on the lines when I want the scene to stop. Why are you doing all this? I'm scanning. The stops are major turning points on life's pathways involving important decisions, possibilities, events which make it necessary to consider alternate choices in time. You are moving along the track, and you decide to stop. Tell me what you do then. I suspend the scene on the screen so I can enter it. How can you leave the panel and go into a scene on Earth 
while still monitoring the action in the rink. I know you probably won't understand this, but part of me stays at the controls so I can start up the scene again and stop at any time. Perhaps I do understand. Can you divide your energy? Yes, I can send thoughts back to myself. Of course, the controllers are helping me too as I go in and out of the screens. It seems to me when souls are in the ring of destiny, they use time almost like a tool. As spirits, we do use time subjectively. Things and events are moved around and become objects in time. But to us, time is uniform. I don't see how you could make many serious mistakes in your choices when you actually experience part of the life in which you plan to live. My choices of life environments are not unlimited. As I said, I probably won't be able to see all of a scene in one time segment because of what they don't show you. There is risk attached to all body choices. If one's future destiny is not fully preordained as you say, why call this space the ring of destiny? Oh, there is destiny all right. The life cycles are in place. It's just that there are so many alternatives which are unclear. When I take my subjects into the spatial area of life selection, they see a circle of past, present, and future time, such as the ring in this case. Sensing they are leaving spiritual now time within the circle, souls apparently rotate back and forth on resonating waves during their observational runs. All aspects of time are presented to them as reoccurring realities ebbing and flowing together. Because parallel realities are superimposed upon one another, they too can be seen as possibilities for physical lives, especially by the more experienced souls. Accepting what befalls us on the road of life as acts of God does not mean our existence should be locked into spiritual determinism where we must submit to an unalterable fate. If everything was preordained, there would be no purpose or justice to our struggle. When adversity strikes, it is not intended that we sit back with a fatalistic attitude and not fight to improve the situation by making on-site changes. During our lives, all of us will experience opportunities for change which involve risk. These occasions may come at inconvenient times. We may not act upon them, but the challenge is there for us. The purpose of reincarnation is the exercise of free will. Without this ability, we would be impotent creatures indeed. Thus, karmic destiny means we are not just caught up in events over which we have no control. This also means we have karmic lessons and responsibilities. The law of cause and effect for our actions always exists, which is why this case did not want to make a mistake in choosing a life unsuited to him. But whatever happens to us in life, it is important we understand that our happiness or pain does not reflect either blessings or betrayal on the part of a god oversoul, our guides, or life selection coordinators. We are the masters of our destiny. Early in human history, when the world was underpopulated, my clients recall lives where they were always born in sparse human settlements. In time, with the rise of villages and then larger centers of ancient civilizations, my cases report returning to the same areas. Life selections were geographically scattered again by the great migrations of people colonizing new lands, particularly in the last 400 years. In this century of overpopulation, more souls are choosing to live in places where they have been before. Spirits do not routinely see their deaths in future lives. If souls choose a life where their death will be premature, they often see it in the place of life selection. I have found that souls essentially volunteer in advance for bodies who will have sudden fatal illnesses, are to be killed by someone, or come to an abrupt end of life with many others from a catastrophic event. Souls who become involved in these tragedies are not caught in the wrong place at the wrong time with a capricious God looking the other way. Every soul has a motive for the events in which it chooses to participate. One client told me his last life was planned in advance to end at seven years of age as an American Indian boy. He said, I was looking for a short burst lesson in humility, and this life as a mistreated starving half-breed was enough. After souls have completed their consultations with guides and peers about the many physical and psychological ramifications of a new life and body choice, 
the decision to incarnate is made. It would be logical to assume that they would then go immediately to earth. This doesn't happen before a significant element of preparation occurs. Souls returning from the place of life selection must not only sort out the best choice of who they are going to be in their next life, but coordinate this decision with other players in the coming drama. Using the analogy of life as being one big stage play, we will have the lead role as an actor or actress. Everything we do in the play affects other minor characters in the script. Their parts can be altered by us and ours by them because script changes can be made while the play is in progress. Those souls who are going to have a close association with us on the stage of life represent our supporting cast, each with prominent roles. But how will we know them? Connecting with beings we know from the spirit world in all sorts of physical disguises can be harmonious or frustrating. The lesson we must learn from human relationships is accepting people for who they are without expecting our happiness to be totally dependent upon anyone. I have had clients come to me with the assumption that they are probably not with a soulmate because of so much turmoil and heartbreak in their marriages and relationships. They fail to realize that karmic lessons set difficult standards for each of us, and painful experiences involving the heart are deliberate tests in life. They are often the hardest kind. Is it close to the time when you will be leaving the spirit world for another life? Yes, I'm about ready. After you left the place of life selection, was your soul mind made up as to who you would be and the people you were to meet on earth? Yes, everything is beginning to come together for me. What if you had second thoughts about your choice of time frame or a particular human body? Could you back out? Yes, I have done that before. We all have, at least the people I know. Most of the time it's intriguing to think about being alive on earth again. But what if you resisted coming back to Earth shortly before you were due to incarnate? It's not that rigid. I would always discuss the possibilities, my concerns for a new life, with my tutor and companions before making a firm commitment. The tutors know when we are stalling, but I have made up my mind. Well, I'm glad. Now, tell me, once you are firmly committed to return to Earth, does anything else of importance transpire for you in the spirit world? I must go to the recognition class. What is this place like for you? It's an observation meeting with my companions so I can recognize them later. When I snap my fingers, you will go immediately to this class. Are you ready? Yes, I am. Explain to me what you are doing. I am floating in with the others to hear the speaker. How does this place appear to you? Mm, a circular auditorium with a raised dais in the middle. That's where the speakers are. How many souls are around us? Oh, about 10 or 15 people who are going to be close to me in the life to come. There are others further away in groups to hear their speakers. Are these speakers your tutor guides? No, they are the prompters. Okay, let's move in close to the prompter while you continue to tell me what is happening. We form a circle around the dais. The prompter is floating back and forth in the center, pointing a finger at each of us and saying we must pay close attention to the signs. I have to do it. I understand, and I wouldn't want you to miss a thing. But please, explain what you mean by signs. This prompter is assigned to us so we will know what to look for in our next life. The signs are placed in our mind now in order to jog our memories later as humans. What kind of signs? Flags, markers in the road of life. The road signs kick us into a new direction in life at certain times when something important is supposed to happen, and then we must know the signs to recognize one another, too. And this class takes place for souls before each new life? Naturally. We need to remember the little things. This class is a final review, bringing us all together. For those of you who will have an impact on each other's lives? That's right. It's mainly a prep class because we won't recognize each other at first on Earth. Do you see your primary soulmate here? She is here, and there are other people that I am supposed to contact, or they will contact me in some way. The others need their signs, too. I'm going to call these signs memory triggers. Are you telling me there will be special triggers for each of these people with you? That's why we have been brought together. There will be times in my life when these people will appear. I must try to remember some action by them, the way they look, move, talk. And each will trigger a memory for you. Yeah, and I'm going to miss some. 
The signs are supposed to click in our memory right away and tell us, Oh good, you are here now. Inside us we can say to ourselves, It is time to work on the next phase. They may seem like insignificant little things, but the flags are turning points in our lives. What if people miss these road flags or signs of recognition because, like you said, you forget what the prompter told you? Or what if you choose to ignore your inclinations and take another path? We have other choices. They may not be as good. You can be stubborn, but after this class, we usually don't forget the important signs. Why don't your guides just give us the answers we need on Earth? Why all this fooling around with signs to remember things? For the same reason we go to Earth without knowing everything in advance. Our soul power grows with what we discover. Sometimes our lessons get resolved pretty fast, usually not. The most interesting part of the road are the turns, and it's best not to ignore the flags in our mind. All right. I'm going to count from ten down to one, and when I reach one, your class will start again and you will listen while the prompter gives out signs. I will not speak until you raise the index finger of your right hand. This will be my sign that the class is over, and you can relate to me the signs you are to remember. Are you ready? Yes. Good. Then tell me about the last sign you were given as the class ended. A silver pendant. I will see it when I am seven years old around the neck of a woman on my street. She always wore it. Why is the soul of this woman important for you to know? I meet her riding my bike on our street. She will read to me and talk to me about life and teach me to respect people. As you grow older, can people themselves be signs or provide flags to help you make a connection? Sure, they might arrange introductions at the right time. Do you already know most of the souls who will be meaningful people to you on Earth? Yes, and if I don't, I'll meet them in class. I guess they can set up love relationship meetings, too? <laughs> oh, the matchmakers. Yes, they do that, but meetings can be for friendship, getting people together to help your career, that kind of stuff. Then the souls who are in this auditorium and elsewhere can be involved with different kinds of associations in your life. Yeah, I'm going to connect with the guy who is on my baseball team. Another one will be a farming partner. Then there will be my lifelong pal from grade school. Okay. Now... Tell me, what is the most important recognition sign you must remember from this prep class? Melinda's laugh. Who is Melinda? My wife-to-be. What is supposed to trigger her recognition of you? <laughs> My big ears, stepping on her toes, dancing. What we feel when we first hold each other. One of the last requirements before embarkation for many souls is to go before the Council of Elders for the second time. While some of my subjects see the Council only once between lives, most see them right after death and just before rebirth. The spirit world is an environment personified by order and the elders want to reinforce the significance of a soul's goals for the next life. Sometimes, my clients tell me they return to their spirit group after this meeting to say goodbye, while others say they leave immediately for reincarnation. The latter procedure was used by a subject who described this exit meeting in the following manner. My guide, Magra, escorts me to a soft, white space, which is like being in a cloud-filled enclosure. I see my committee of three waiting for me as usual. The middle elder seems to have the most commanding energy. They all have oval faces, high cheekbones, no hair, and smallish features. They seem to me to be sexless, or rather, they appear to blend from male to female and back. I feel calm. The atmosphere is formal, but not unfriendly. Each in turn asks me questions in a gentle way. The elders are all knowing about my entire span of lives, but they are not as directive as one might think. They want my input to assess my motivations and the strength of my resolve toward working in a new body. I am sure they have had a hand in the body choices I was given for the life to come because I feel they are skilled strategists in life selection. The committee wants me to honor my contract. They stress the benefits of persistence and holding to my values under adversity. I often give in too easily to anger, and they remind me of this while reviewing my past actions and reactions toward events and people. The elders and Magra give me inspiration, hope, and encouragement to trust myself more in bad situations and not let things get out of hand. 
And then, as a final act to bolster my confidence when I'm about to leave, they raise their arms and send a power bolt of positive energy into my mind to take with me. One aspect of the two council meetings which I initially found rather odd is that members of the same soul group do not necessarily go before the same panel. For a while, I assumed there would always be a correlation here because all members of a single soul group have the same guide. I was wrong. In the minds of my subjects, even senior guides are thought to be a couple of steps below the developmental level of the omnipotent beings who make up their councils. They are similar to the old ones that Thies talked about, but with more specific responsibilities toward life evaluation of souls. While a guide might in some respects be considered a personal confidant to a soul, this same familiarity does not extend to an elder. In time, I came to appreciate that an elder's authority, unlike that of guides, involves a cross-section of souls from many groups. Apparently, everyone in a soul group respects the intensely private nature of these proceedings. They all see their individual council of elders as godly. The elders are bathed in bright light, and the whole setting has an aura of divinity. A subject put it this way, When we are taken into the presence of these superior beings who exist in such a high spiritual realm, it validates our feelings about the source of creation. Rebirth is a profound experience. Those souls getting ready for embarkation to earth are like battle-hardened veterans girding themselves for combat. This is the last chance for souls to enjoy the omniscience of knowing just who they are before they must adapt to a new body. My last case involves the soul of a woman who offers us a well-defined description of her most recent passage to earth. Has the time arrived for you to be reborn into your next life? Yes, it has. What is uppermost in your mind about returning to Earth? The opportunity to live in the 20th century. It's an exciting time of many changes. And have you seen this life, or at least parts of it, in advance? Yes, I've been through that. Is there something else you want to talk to me about concerning your next incarnation? I'm having a last talk with my guide, Pomar, on all the alternatives to my life. Without analyzing or censoring your impressions in any way, tell me what you are feeling at this moment. I'm just gathering myself for the big jump into a new life. There is apprehension, but I am excited, too. Are you a little scared and perhaps wondering if you should go to Earth at all? Mm, a little concerned for what lies ahead of me. Leaving my home here, but happy, too, at the opportunity. So you have mixed emotions about leaving the spirit world. Most of us do, as our time draws near. I have second thoughts before some lives, but Pomar knows when I am lagging behind my schedule. You can't hide anything here, you know. Okay, let's assume it's a go situation for your next life. On the count of three, your decision to return at an appointed time is firm, and you are in the final stage to leave the spirit world. One, two, three... Describe to me what happens to you now. I say goodbye to everyone. This can be difficult. Anyway, they all wish me well, and I move away from them, drifting alone. There is no great rush. Pomar allows me to collect my thoughts. When I am quite ready, he comes to escort me, to offer encouragement, reassurance, and he knows when I am prepared to go. I sense that you are now more upbeat about the prospect of rebirth. Yes, it's a period of inspiration and expectations, a new body, the course ahead. All right. You and Pomar are together for your exit from the spirit world. I want you to go deep inside yourself and explain to me what you do next as if it were happening in slow motion. Go. We begin to move at a greater speed. Then I am aware of Pomar detaching from me, and I am alone. You are alone and moving faster. Then what? Away, slanting away through pillows of whiteness, moving away. I'm passing through folds of silky cloth, smooth. I'm on a band, a pathway, faster and faster. And everything is blurred. I'm sliding down, down into a long, dark tube, hollow feeling. Darkness, then warmth, 
Where are you now? I'm aware of being inside my mother. I'm in a baby. I'm a baby. Well, I'm glad you arrived safe and sound in your new body. Tell me, how old is the baby? Five months have passed since conception. Is this your usual arrival time as far as the maturation of a child? In my lives, I have arrived at different times, depending on the baby, the mother, and my life-to-be. What do you do when you are not with the unborn baby? You want the truth? <laughs> I'll tell you. Me? I play. It's a fine time to leave and purely goof off when the baby is less active. I have fun with my friends who are doing the same thing. We bounce around Earth to visit with each other and go to interesting places where we have once lived together in former lives. Oh, when your soul enters a baby to remain with this new body for a lifetime, give me the scope of this undertaking. Once I attach to a child, it is necessary to bring my mind into synchronization with the brain. We have to get used to each other as partners. This is what other people tell me, but do you and the baby have an affinity for each other right away? Well, I am in the mind of the child, but separate, too. I go slowly at first. It's delicate and can't be hurried. I start with a, a gentle probe, defining connections, gaps. Every mind is different. Is there any conflict within the child against you? There is a slight resistance in the beginning, not full acceptance while I trace the passages. That's usual until there is familiarization. I keep bumping into myself. Did it take you many lives to learn to trace a human brain? A while. New souls are assisted with their tracing. Be completely frank with me. Isn't your soul taking over this mind and subjugating it to your will? You don't understand. It's a melding. There is an emptiness before my arrival which I fill to make the baby whole. Do you bring intellect? We expand what is there. Could you be more specific about what your soul actually provides the human body? We bring a comprehension of things, a recognition of the truth of what the brain sees. Are you sure this child doesn't think of you at first as an alien entity in her mind? No, that's why we unify with undeveloped minds. She recognizes me as a friend, a twin who is going to be part of her. It's as if the baby was waiting for me to come. Do you think a higher power prepares the baby for you? I don't know. It would seem so. Is your work at unification completed before birth? Not really. But at birth, we have started to complement each other. So, the unification process does take some time. Sure, while we adjust to each other. And, like I told you, I leave the unborn baby at intervals. How far along in age is the body by the time your soul stops leaving the child altogether? At about five or six years of age. Usually, we get fully operational when the child starts school. Children under this age can be left to their own devices a lot. Don't you have a duty to always be with your body? If things get bad in a physical way, then I'm back inside like a shot. How would you know this if you were off fooling around with other souls? Every brain has a wave pattern. It's like a fingerprint. We know immediately if the baby assigned to us is in trouble. So you are watching the baby assigned to you all the time, both inside and out, during the early stages of growth? Oh, yes, and I watch the parents. They might be having squabbles around the baby, which sets up disturbing vibrations. Well, if this happens to the child, what do you do as its soul? Quiet the child as best as I can. Reach out to the parents through the baby to calm them. As a soul, you can control motor movements of the baby? I can push a little on that part of the brain which controls movements. I can tickle the kid's funny bone sometimes, too. I'll do whatever it takes to bring harmony to my assigned family. Well, tell me what it is like being inside a mother's womb. I like the warm, comfortable feeling of love. Most of the time there is love. Sometimes there's stress. Anyway... I use this time to think and plan what I'm going to do after birth. I think about my past lives and missed opportunities with other bodies, and this gives me incentive. And you haven't had the memories of all your past lives and your life in the spirit world blocked out by amnesia? That starts after birth. When the baby is born, does it have any conscious thoughts of who its soul is and the reason for the attachment? The child mind is so undeveloped it does not reason out this information. It does have parts of this knowledge as a means of comfort, which then fades. By the time I speak, this 
information is locked deep inside me, and that's the way it's supposed to be. So, will you have fleeting thoughts of other lives as a child? Yes. We daydream the way we play as children, creating stories, having imaginary friends who are real. But it fades. In the first few years of life, babies know more than they are given credit for. All right. Now, it is the time right before your birth in this life. Tell me what you were doing. I'm listening to my father play records. Very relaxing for him. It helps him to think. I'm a bit anxious for him. Why? He thinks he wants a boy, but I'll change his mind in a hurry. So, this is a productive time for you? Yes. I'm busy planning for the approaching time when I will enter the world as a human and take that first breath. This is my last chance for quiet contemplation of the next life. When I come out, I'll be running. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. Audible hopes you have enjoyed it.